we are possessed by immature wanting, perpetrated by media, television, politicians, your parents, the education system, and we spend money for the dopamine rush, very often on things we don't need. Now, this is not just articles of clothing or fancy cars or gigantic houses. It's also ideas such as you need to be in a relationship. You are not a true man unless you get married and have 2.5 kids. You need a college degree or you're a failure at life. This is Vishen Lakiani. He's a mastermind behind the wildly successful $100 million personal growth movement, Mind Valley. Today, he's an entrepreneur, author, and activist. But if you were to go back in time, and meet Vishen in the late 90s, you'd find a computer engineering grad who was interning at Microsoft and hating every minute of it. So he quit moving to New York to chase down his dreams. I was broke. I was earning 25 grand a year in New York, living a life for one year. But in that one year, I met the woman I would later marry and have two kids with. I came up with the business idea that today led to Mind Valley. I met the co-founder being broke ass in New York, but following my heart. It's like a remarkable story, but what advice would you have for those of us who are just starting out? Try to fully listen to your spirit, your soul, and understand what it is that you truly desire to be at your core level. And that is typically something fairly original. And often it's something that other people will go, what the f you really want to do that? And that's actually a good sign because the people who are doing great things in the world, all of them did stuff that made conventional society scratch their head. In The Buddha and the Badass, you make this amazing statement. You write that too many of us are running after what we think we want because we've been brainwashed to believe these are our needs. Mm -hmm. when, oh, when I read that, I was like, oh my goodness, how many years have I spent chasing the things that I thought I wanted only to get them and go like, well, this doesn't make me happy. Yeah, I mean, it happens to so many of us, right? This is the definition of the midlife crisis. People wake up at the age of 40 going, what the hell did I do with my life? But I mean, there's so many reasons for it. One of it is um, I went to an American university and when you go to school in America, you're legally legally asked to think of your future career, to choose your future career before you can legally buy a beer. Before I could, I was of legal drinking age, I had to decide I was going to be an engineer and enroll into a, an expensive four-year program in computer engineering at the University of Michigan. And then I graduate from the program. I get into this incredible job at Microsoft because I thought I wanted that only to realize how miserable I was. So I, I ended up quitting 11 weeks later and never really using my degree again. I went into a completely different field. That was an expensive lesson. But the reason this happens is because there are two types of wanting in the life. Now, the philosopher Michael Beckwith, and if you don't know Michael Beckwith, he is a, a philosopher, preacher at the Agape Spiritual Center in Los Angeles. He's a random fact about him. He is the man, the spiritual teacher in more documentaries than any other personal growth teacher alive today. Michael Beckett. And that's because he's so passionate. Does that mean that he's passionate or he has a really good publicist? He's brilliant. He's passionate. His <laughs> ideas are mind blowing, but there's something I learned from him and it's called mature wanting versus immature wanting. So immature wanting is the wanting that comes from the, the influx of information from media, television, politicians, your parents, your, the education system, basically a society designed to track its efficacy and the quality of how it functions through this arbitrary thing called GDP. So we're told that we need clothing. We need this, 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 this new clothing. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting you walk around naked, but consider this fact, right? In the 1980s, the average American would buy 12 new articles of clothing a year. Right now, it's 62. And so we are buying more stuff than we could ever use than we need. I mean, how did we come up with this crazy idea of a garage and two cars? If you go to Europe, I live in Europe now. I moved to Europe. Um, I have a choice. I could live in America. I have residency there. I have residency in Europe. In Europe, I have two bicycles. There's no reason for a freaking car because I love the cobblestone streets and the walking cities I'm in. But this idea, this bull idea perpetrated by the root cause, I guess, is GDP means we are possessed by immature wanting. And we spend money for the dopamine rush very often on things we don't need. Now, this is not just articles of clothing or fancy cars or gigantic houses. 
It's also ideas such as you need to be in a relationship. You are not a true man unless you get married and have 2.5 kids and a house with a garage. You need a college degree or you're a failure at life. And so this immature wanting pulls us in different directions, but it rarely speaks to our soul. Now, what is the opposite? What is mature wanting? Mature wanting is when you can tap into what your soul truly desires. When I was working at Microsoft, I realized I hated my job. And you know why I took that job and why I spent four years as a computer engineer? Because I developed an immature desire from the advice of my grandfather. My grandfather um, had grown up in India. And in the 1990s, Bill Gates visited India. And this was a big deal for India. It was a massive deal. It was all over the news. Now, my grandfather at that point was living in Malaysia. But he I remember being in a car with him and he said, Vision, you must be like Bill Gates, richest man in the world. You must go into computers. And so I got into Georgetown University, which was my dream university, but they didn't have a computer science program. So I decided to unenroll from Georgetown and enroll in Michigan, not realizing how freaking cold it gets. And <laughs> I live a few hours from there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and enrolled in computer engineering. And I hate it. I hated the four years. I just, I was not good at it. I didn't enjoy it. You know what I really wanted to do? Performing arts. But my grandfather, whom I really respected, said, acting is for losers. Never be an actor. Actors, ne he, he had all of these, these, these theories. And I, and I love the man. He's no longer alive. But the influence from past generations gave me this immature wanting. So I end up going to Michigan. I get that job at Microsoft. I literally get invited to a party at Bill Gates' home. And there I am shaking hands with the hold on, Bill Hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm sorry. How did that happen? So back then in 1998, Bill Gates actually invited all the, the new interns who got jobs at Microsoft to his home for a barbecue. And he would flip burgers for us and make really? us, yeah, his beautiful house in Lake Washington. And, um, and one week later, I quit because I realized I did not want to be like Bill Gates. I did not want to be in freaking computer engineering. I actually wanted to be doing something completely different. So you know what I did? <laughs> I became a broke actor. I signed up and joined some theater troops. Then I moved to New York. I started working for an NGO that focused on world peace. I was broke. I was earning 25 grand a year in New York, living a, a shitty life for one year. But in that one year, I met the woman I would later marry and have two kids with. I came up with the business idea that today led to Mind Valley. I met friends of mine who had an incredible impact on my life. I met the co-founder of the company I would later start all in that one year, being broke ass in New York, but following my heart. You see, when you follow your heart, mature wanting, sometimes I believe our soul knows more about our future life direction than we can process on a, at a conscious level. And when you follow that heart, call it instinct, God, call it your gut, call it your hunch, you often end up exactly where you need to be for your fulfillment and your happiness. Maybe this is why Steve Jobs, okay, look at Steve Jobs as an example. For everybody who says, oh, oh, immature wanting is for losers. You're never gonna be rich and successful. Well, look at Steve Jobs. The guy fricking moved to India. It's like a remarkable story, but what advice would you have for those of us who are just starting out? A hippie for a while, he dropped out of Reed College to learn calligraphy because he really wanted to learn calligraphy and not you know, what his parents wanted him to learn. But all of that came together. All of these became breadcrumbs that led to his destiny. Mature wanting is the breadcrumbs that lead you to your destiny. Steve followed his heart, studied calligraphy. He followed his heart. He went to India. All of this came together and helped him start the company that became Apple. And in his Stanford commencement address in 2005, he said this, always follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know who you are to become. And he also said, drown out the voices that pull you away from this. So this was a really important lesson. And this is what I wanted to articulate. You must understand the difference between mature wanting and immature wanting. Drown out the voices that are telling you that you need that particular car or you need to be, you need to be following this particular pattern of building a family that maybe your mom or your dad did and try to fully listen to your spirit, your soul, and understand what it is that you truly desire to be at your core level. And that is typically something fairly original. And often it's something that other people will go, what the fuck? You really want to do that? And that's actually a good sign because the people who are doing great things in the world, all of them did stuff 
that conventional society that made conventional society scratch their head. I love it. I love it so much because you're like, I, I just, I can listen to you talk. I mean, many people do, right? This is, this is what you do for a living. But I could totally see how your background, your mm-hmm. education, your background, your experience, plus your desire for performing arts have come together. I mean, Mind Valley is a tech platform. You know, it, it does help shape you to be a better CEO and a better leader and, and, and to be able to, to do these things. So one, if you're listening and you're saying like, oh, I've wasted years, nothing is wasted, of course. But I want to ask, when you reference Steve Jobs, I mean, how would you respond to this? You know, Cal Newport has a great book, you know, Be So Good, So Good They Can't Ignore You. And yeah. he breaks down the, the Steve Jobs story slightly differently, where he says, yes, he went off to India, and yes, he was a beatnik, and yes, he did all of these things. But the only reason they started Apple was because they could sell a few chipboards. And then mm-hmm. one client was like, we don't want, you know, these, these boards, these motherboards, or whatever they were, we want computers. And he's like, oh, we can make computers, we can make more money. And so it wasn't like Cal yeah. Newport is suggesting it's revisionist history to say, like, follow your heart. No, like, like maybe try things and test things and, and what have yeah. you. But what would you say to that, that other side, which says... So let's, so let's yeah. look at Cal Newport's theory. So these theories are not... Uh, and I, and, I, and I, like, I like his book, but these theories are not opposite. But ultimately, see, these theories come from two different worldviews. There is the purely logic, empirical, um, Newtonian worldview right? Where everything is is purely cause and effect. And then there's the worldview that we are more than just physical beings, that we have a spirit, we have a soul, we have intuition, we have, we can manifest synchronicity, we can create that the universe will give us signs and coincidences. Now, it doesn't matter what worldview you abide to, okay? I abide to the second kind, because in my life, I've seen, I've been pulled so often by intuition, I had an intuition to start Mind Valley, which became a hundred million dollar company. That was that was literally intuition. I remember walking through the rain in New York one day with this strong feeling, and it made no logical sense. Okay, so it depends on your worldview. But actually, let's look at hard data and hard science. If you go down the path where you are doing something to please someone else, to please your mom or your dad, and I and I and I made that mistake. I became an engineer because my grand grandfather, whom I really respected because he was an amazing, amazing man, because he asked me to be an engineer. Sign shows that if you are doing anything that you do not truly enjoy, that it is suppressing your happiness levels, your states of bliss, you are going to suck at it. So there's a whole book (laughs) by Sean Aker, it's called The Happiness Advantage, right? And Sean Aker goes on to cite all of these studies. Doctors who are primed to be happy do 19% better at diagnoses. Salespeople, they do 55% better at sales calls. We do better at stuff that we love. There's, this is hard fact. In Shizad Shamin's book, Positivity Quotient, PQ, he says that your positivity quotient is the ratio of your happy moments, your blissful moments to your overall emotional state. And the more blissful moments you have, the better you're going to do it, whatever you're doing. So if you're trying to build a semiconductor company or you're trying to write a book, guess what? If you're doing it because you truly love it and not because you were pressured into it, you are going to be more successful. Now, in PQ, Shajat Samin literally shares that even when it comes to teams, the only thing that determines the effectiveness of a team is their PQ, their positivity quotient. How positive do the teams feel about the work that they're doing? Only factor that correlates with the, the, the performance of a team. So PQ is important. So if you decide to hammer away at something repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly till you get good at it, if you don't enjoy it, you are never going to be world-class. You are basically going to suck. But if you are hammering away with some at something because you truly enjoy it, you enjoy the thrill of it, you enjoy the process of it, now, you are more likely to become insanely successful. But there's also the question of marketing. If you're hammering away at something that is unique, that is unique, that is different, you're more likely to be successful than doing something that everyone else is doing. And this is why I say, if people are scratching your head at your business decision, it's probably a good sign. <laughs> so I, 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 when I started Mind Valley. You wouldn't believe the number of people who told me, you want to sell meditation CDs. So this was way back when CDs were a thing. 
who's going to buy meditation CDs? Well, it turns out a lot of people, right? In 2003, though, they didn't see that. But it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew until 2018, 45% of Fortune 400 companies are offering meditation classes for their employees. But because I started first, I started when people were scratching their heads at my business decision. It happened. And we see this. We see this so much right now with people who are artisans who are creating unique products, whether it's a unique restaurant or it's a unique type of book or it's a unique app. So many of these are taking off right now because of the world of Instagram, where uniqueness, where visuals, where storytelling matters. Social media has actually been a gift for all of these people. And this is why I still stand by my thesis. Do what you love. When you said that the soul knows more about our future than our head does or our brain, I was like, you know what? There is so much truth to that. It's almost like we know in our hearts what we want, but our head talks us out of it. Right. Now, I have struggled. You, you talk about the midlife crisis. I'm turning 40 next year. I feel embarrassed to, to feel like I've been going through a midlife crisis for a few years, but with the pandemic and with the shift and with the change and with everything we've been dealing with, who isn't dealing with a little bit of a midlife crisis? But what I found is that I am really good at some things and I can, I can get paid and make a living doing the things that I'm really good at. I don't enjoy them. And I've spoken to a few people about this, but there, we, we can fall into this trap as well. And I'm looking for your advice. I'm looking for your help. What do we do when, you know, when we look at our gifts that we've been given, when we look at our skill sets, when we look at the way that we make money? I mean, I am not only good at it and people value it and they're willing to pay me for it. And I've built my entire business or my entire life or all of my, my status is hinging on me being that person. And yet I just don't like it. But the other thing I do like, I mean, I, I'm not yet maybe very good at, and, I, and I, I don't have income yet, and I don't have any of those other things. Just because you're good at it doesn't mean that you should be doing it. What do you think about that? Just because you're good at it doesn't mean you should be doing it. Well, I think you got to make a gradual shift, right? So in my case, this, this is how I made my shift. So I was in technology sales, and I didn't like it, but I was really good at it. I was making decent money. What I wanted to do was teach meditation because meditation had transformed my life and I wanted to become a certified teacher of meditation. Um, the system I was looking at was the Silva method and I wanted to build a website to sell meditation and to get people into my class. Now, obviously I can't go from like technology sales to all of a sudden being a meditation teacher overnight. You make the shift gradually. So what I did was, um, and this is a very useful tool that people can use. I looked at a concept that I coined and call MLI, minimum livable income. So I was living in New York with my girlfriend at that time. She was European, so she, she couldn't actually work in the United States. Um, and so she was unemployed. She was waiting to get a job, waiting to get a visa. It was really tough, actually. And I, in technology sales, I was making 7,500 bucks a month. Now, I knew, however, that we were spending $4,000 a month on rent, food, entertainment, and you know, going out occasionally with friends. So $4,000 was my MLI, my minimum livable income. So what I did was I worked nights and weekends to build my tiny little sucky meditation website. <laughs> and, um, first tiny month, little sucky, what a great way yeah, to describe it. Month, it was January, 2003. First month, we lost maybe 300 bucks. Second month, I lost 800 bucks. Third month, I made maybe a couple of hundred bucks, right? And each time I made that couple of hundred bucks from this meditation website, I celebrated. I, I celebrated. I mean, at, at a certain point, I was making, I remember this number. It was $4.50 a day. And I was so excited about that because with 4 bucks and 50 cents a day, I could go to Starbucks and I could like get a venti cappuccino with hazelnut flavoring. I remember bragging to my friends, I had this little meditation website that got me free Starbucks every day. And they thought that was pretty cool. That's, but I was obsessed with it. And then I aim, I set a goal. Could I get from $4.50 of profit a day to maybe 20 bucks a day? And then I hit that. And then I set a goal to get to 40 bucks a day. And I hit that it was a personal challenge and I enjoyed it. And so I was working nights and weekends. Pretty soon I was putting in maybe 10 hours a week in addition to my, my technology sales job on this website. I loved it. It was like, it was like, it was quality time. I'd rather do it than watch than watch Netflix. This was back when Netflix was on CDs. And in 10 months, 
it got to $4,000 a month. In 10 months, I hit that magic number. I called up my boss and I quit. <laughs> and that's when I went. I think, I think some people call that FU money, right? Like when you hit that threshold where you're just like, I, right. I am now in control, right? And I could see that it was going up and I could see that it could go, it could go higher and higher and higher. So it took me 10 months to get to four grand a month, putting in 10 hours a week. But I loved it. That 10 hours never felt like work. And now I was only doing that. Now, of course, when this happened, I, I, I lost my US visa because I was born in Malaysia. And when I quit the company, I lost my US visa. So my wife and I, we had to move uh, back to Estonia, where she's from, or Malaysia, where I was born. And so we, we lived in those two countries. And we continued hammering away with this website. And we went from four grand to 20 grand from 20 grand to 100 grand. Today, we are at maybe, I mean, today we are well over 100 million revenue for this business called Mind Valley with no venture capital, with no investors. It's a private company, uh, 400 employees, 100 million in revenue. Um, and I live a life where every single day I'm doing what I love. I, that's inspiring. And thank you for breaking that down because um, I'm curious though, if before you started, right, you're making your 7,800 or your $7,000 a year, you're living in New York, you're going out with friends, you got your girlfriend, all of that stuff. If at that moment when you're doing the sales job that you're not happy with, if, if, we were to, if I were to say to you, hey, in a year, you're going to be doing something you love, mm -hmm. but you're going to have to leave the US. You, I, I don't know. Would you have been like, huh? No, I, would have still I don't know if I really want to pick up my life and leave the US and get forced out of the country. And, and what was I working for? Like, right. but, but somewhere along the way, somewhere yeah. along the way, I'm assuming you're like, you know what? It's worth the sacrifice for this. No, no. Well, firstly, I, it wasn't a sacrifice. Like we wanted to experience Southeast Asia. Southeast, Southeast Asia in the 2010s was an exciting place to be. You know, you could wake up, hop on a flame, be in a beach in, in Thailand, go visit Bali. It's an exciting place to be. So that wasn't bad at all. Cool. And, and, right now, <laughs> and, and right now, I choose to be in Europe. I think Europe is the most exciting. The EU is the most exciting place to be in the world. And so I, I build my life so I have location mobility. And um, and I just got my US O visa. So now technically, if I wanted to live and live, work and live in America, I could do that as well. So that that's important to me as well. But it, it wasn't really that. It wasn't that I... I was disappointed to leave the US. I think that's a fairly uh, American centric um, viewpoint. No, Southeast Asia was hella exciting back then. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah. And, and the only reason I assume that you're right, it is, it is very biased of me to assume is that, you know, you worked so hard going to university and living all over the place. But um, listen, at the, at the beginning of the year, the beginning of, of this calendar year, I have realized that I can live um, in a fairly peaceful state. Right. And I've, I work on my anxiety because I have GAD. Uh, mm -hmm. I work on you know, sleep and hydration and exercise and food. And I can learn to let stuff go, but I lose my ambition. And my, the, the pressure that makes me hustle and work. Or I can, I can really focus on like achievement, but then I lose the peace that I have. And I, I know that you know, one of your books, uh, you know, The Buddha and the Badass that was released in 2020, perhaps speaks to this very well. But, yes. but I want both. <laughs> like, like I, don't, I don't necessarily want achievement, but I want progress. And I want to know that I'm moving forward. And I want to know that I'm not wasting time. And at the same time, though, I don't want to, I don't want to show up to my kids and my spouse and my team, right. like really wound up and, and in fight or flight mode all the time and just like right. hammering people all the time. And I haven't figured out how to balance this. How do we hold on to the peace while still so just, being ambitious? So you just said it. You said it yourself. You wanted progress, but not achievement. Very often, achievement is a means goal. It's, it's a means goal. It's a means to an end. It's not the achievement we want. It might be the boost of confidence. It might be that we want to achieve because we think it's going to attract the love of our life. It could be that we want to achieve because we want to make our parents proud of us. Achievement is an illusion. Achievement is immature wanting. Let me share with you a story. In 2010, okay, so I had my meditation website, but it was growing slowly because way back in 2010, meditation was still not as big as it was right now. And so we were not getting as much press or something. And at the same time, the tech sector in Malaysia was blowing up. All of these new companies were emerging. The tech sector was just blowing up. There was VC money flying everywhere. And I decided, I want a piece of that. And I decided I wanted media retention. I wanted to get venture funding. I wanted a company that was talked about. I wanted a hot technology company. 
And so what, I what jumped drove up. that within you? I just, I just wanted attention. I wanted media attention. I wanted oh, to be written yeah. out the press. It was all of these bullshit triggers for achievement. So I went to one of the top investors in the country. I pitched an idea and I got $2 million in capital. $2 million in capital, right? And I became a co-founder of this company. Now, this company was a Groupon clone for Southeast Asia. You remember Groupon? The coupon yeah, yeah, company yeah. became yeah. the fastest growing company in the world and it, it fizzled out and died. So I started a Groupon clone for Malaysia. And um, we got $2 million in capital. I had to hire this entire team. I started building up the company. Six months in, I sank into a depression. I couldn't pull myself to the office. I had the media attention. We got so much press. I had $2 million in, in a bank account. I, I had this, these, these investors who were like, like pushing me to, 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 to grow the company. I had a great team. I got everything I wanted. I was now part of that Silicon Valley um, a bubble in Malaysia. But I hated my life. And so I had to go to my investors and say, guys, I'm out. Like if I continue doing this, this depression is going to get hardcore. And I had a two-year-old son at that point. I did not want to be like miserable while raising a two-year-old boy because that's inevitably going to affect your kids. So I gave up my shares and I quit. And that was one of the biggest lessons I ever learned. I lost touch with my own heart and I went down that stupid path simply because I wanted accomplishment. Now, here's the counterpart of that story. When I quit, I got really lonely um, and I needed something to do. So again, Mind Valley was just kind of moving on its own. I had no, Mind Valley was just a little meditation website kind of floating on its own, not, not growing, not shrinking, bringing in some good cash flow, but you know, just, just there. And I decided I wanted to, to connect with amazing people around the world. So I decided to, and I also, I also got really into surfing. So <laughs> you can't surf in Malaysia. Surfing isn't good in Malaysia, nor is it in Bali, but it's good in Costa Rica. So I decided to launch a surf festival in Costa Rica. So here's the crazy idea. I had a blog at that time. I was blogging uh, for fun. And on my blog, I said, I want to get 250 people to Costa Rica for a festival. We're going to go to Witches Rock, which is a famous surfing beach. We're going to surf. We're going to bring in these speakers. We're going to have these really cool parties at night. I have space for 250 people. It's going to cost you two grand. Uh, is anyone in? And I sold every single ticket, 250 tickets sold. I was blown away because all I wanted to do was just experience Costa Rica. It was my dream destination, surf and hang out with cool people. I call the festival Awesomeness Fest because, you know, in surfing lingo, awesome, yeah, yeah. Uh, radical, groovy. I called it Awesomeness Fest. And this launched in December 2010. Awesomeness Fest became so successful. Today, it's called AFEST. You can actually go to AFEST.com. It became so massively successful. It exploded. It exploded. And uh, if you if you follow AFEST on Instagram, AFEST, or if you go to AFEST.com, you'll see like how massive this festival is. It's now one of the most um, sought after events for top level entrepreneurs. We, we, we accept 350 people at each event. It is the most incredible thing in my life. It's it's art, it's theater, it's, it's, it's the most amazing parties, it's inspiring speakers. And from Awesomeness Fest, it got so amazing that it gave me the idea to go to my little meditation website and transform it. So I took my meditation website, I took Awesomeness Fest, I mashed this together, and this in 2013 became Mind Valley. It became the new Mind Valley that was growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Because we now had a brand, we had a purpose, we had a mission. We had our own freaking cool, epically cool festival. And all the speakers coming to this festival would sign up and become authors on our platform. But think about how all of that started. I quit my immature wanting. I quit this bullshit sense of accomplishment. And all I decided to do was follow my heart, go to Costa Rica, and figure out how to get people to teach me surfing. <laughs> and that led. What, what gives you, what gives, like, what is it within you? Is it your, is your makeup? Where, where do you get the confidence to say, you know what? I think I can do this surfing thing. I think I'll give it a shot. So, so you see, you answered this yourself when you said, I don't want accomplishment. I want progress. Yeah. Everything I did with Awesomeness Fest wasn't designed. I wasn't, it wasn't designed for accomplishment. Dude, I just wanted to fucking surf. <laughs> I 
wanted to hang out with cool people. Cool people and and be awesome. I wanted to be have an excuse to be in Costa Rica. I remember in the middle of Awesomeness Fest, my investor called me up. He was pissed off. He was so pissed off. He's like, "You quit the company I helped you start to start a fucking go surfing." It's not a fucking festival. Those was his words. Now, the company, that little company that Groupon clone collapsed in three years. It literally collapsed. The entire industry, coupon industry collapsed. Awesomeness Fest spawned a fest, which spawned Mind Valley, which now does 100 million in revenue. And last week, HSBC um, and PricewaterhouseCoopers declared Mind Valley as the next Southeast Asian startup to reach unicorn status. In other words, billion dollar status. You see how magical life can be? And this is why I say, for God's sake, people, follow your heart. You never know where it's going to lead you. Oh, man. Thank you for sharing that story. I love that so much. You know, I had um, I had Charlie Borman on the podcast, and he's really good friends with Um McGregor. And they did this little thing where they rode around the world on motorcycles about 20 years ago. And then... Uh, they decided to ride from England down to South Africa. And then they decided to ride from, uh, you know, from, from, I guess, the tip of South America all the way up north. And it launched his television career and it launched this whole second act to his life when, uh, because, and when I asked him like, hey, what was the thinking behind this? Like amazing thing that it turned into. He's like, I just wanted to hang out with my friend, Ewan. And I just needed a way to pay for this trip around the world. So we thought, why don't we just do like a documentary or something, which exactly. turned into a TV show, which turned into the second show, which turned into, right. you know, him living all of his dreams. <laughs> right. But it right. feels so like so, unattainable for most people, for most of us. It just feels like, you know, like, like I don't think I can replicate your Let me tell you, it feels unattainable because most of you have forgotten who you are. You are not just a blood-filled sack of meat on a rock around the sun. You are a particle of God experiencing yourself. You can literally bend reality. Steve Jobs, his, I, I found the exact quote. The exact quote by Jobs is, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Notice those words. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. He's talking about mature wanting. And he says, everything else is secondary. Google that. That was the Stanford commencement address. Now, why does Steve Jobs believe in this? You know, in his biography by Walter Isaacson, Walter Isaacson uses the following phrase in Steve Jobs' biography three times, bend reality. He speaks about Jobs' ability to bend reality. He writes about how Jobs believed in the Sanskrit idea of prana or an intuitive understanding of the world. You see, we have and intuition. We have a soul that is a guiding force moving us towards who we are destined to be. Don't shut that down. And anybody who tells you intuition is woo woo. No, they're just a freaking idiot. There's so much evidence that intuition is real. We can talk about that later. But not only is intuition real, but all of us have the ability to bend reality. What you believe to be true about the world, what you focus on in your mind will inevitably come true. There is a delicate art to it. So I'm not saying it's easy or you just instantly get it. There's a delicate art to it. Some people call it manifesting. Some people say it's the brain's particular activating system. But when you can shut down the immature wanting, the I need that to feel accomplished, whatever the fuck that means, and focus on what my heart is calling me to do, as Steve Jobs said, you will, all else is secondary, and your heart and soul know who you are truly meant to become you will see breadcrumbs before you, guiding you towards your mission. This is why I disagree with Cal Newport, because Cal Newport goes for a purely materialistic, physical understanding of the world, devoid and absent of what it truly means to be human, which is that we are a soul, a particle of God, experiencing a reality that we are creating every second of every minute of every hour of every day through the thoughts in our head. You just, I just got a little uncomfortable as you were speaking because I actually had to put Cal Newport's book down halfway through. Nothing against him or anything else, but I found it really sad. I felt like as I was reading it, I was like, wow, this goes so against what I've experienced and so against what I believe. Now, I'm not just looking for confirmation bias. I'm not just looking for you to come and make me feel better about the things I already believe. But 
and for our listeners, Cal Newport's approach is just like, listen, you know, following your passion doesn't take you anywhere. Like the, the answer is to develop skill sets and to allow your skill sets and your skill set development to take you further and to be really, really good at something. Be so good at it that people will want you not following your passion just because your passion decides to take you off to some far land. And I found it so, um, I don't know, I just, I was sad. I was sad reading it. It just felt like, like the, maybe the romance of life or the magic of what could be or the hope of a future yet untold was like being taken away from me. And until you said that, I didn't realize why I was so sad by reading this book, if you know what I mean. Right. So here's what's happening in the Western world. In 1973, an anthropologist by the name of Erica Bourguignon coined a phrase called perceptual diversity. And she says that if you look at all of the indigenous cultures, they had access to information beyond the five senses. They are dream tribes in the Amazon. I've actually gone and lived and stayed with some of these dream tribes like the Achua. They communicate across distance through dreams. And what they are able to communicate with other tribes people through dreams is, is uncanny. You look at Kung Fu masters. I've worked, I'm, I'm a former martial artist. I have a double black belt in Taekwondo. Martial artists, masters, work with an intuition and an energy that is crazy, not only perceiving information, but sending energy. I'm sure you've heard of Bruce Lee and his one inch punch. All of this fall under a concept called perceptual diversity, which is the ability to sense, to feel, to listen beyond our five senses. 70% of indigenous cultures have some form of perceptual diversity in their lifestyle. But in the Western world, this is shut down. Because we start to believe that everything that cannot be proven by science is somehow wrong. Now, the funny thing is this, intuition has been proven by science. Meditation has been proven by science, but still scientists. And I got into this debate with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson said, no, 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 intuition isn't real. There's no science for it. No bullshit, Neil, there is science for it. But we'll, we'll come to that later. But it is this stubborn Western idea that only thing that's real is what we see with our five senses that makes us shut down to these, these ideas that we are souls having a human experience. Now, the reason so many people in the Western world, including Neil deGrasse Tyson, are so resistant to it is something called the pre-trans policy. Now, here we got to get into a concept called integral theory, but I want to explain this because this will, the people who are listening today who are skeptics, I can guarantee you they are falling for the pre-trans policy. So this is a word coined by Ken Wilber, the great philosopher, and he says, People who exist in the rational state of awareness, which is, you know, Silicon Valley, Wall Street, rational state of awareness, they are, they are, they are unable to see anything beyond the rational state in terms of proper delineation. So they look at magical thinking, which may come from olden religions, right? Ideas of a talking bush on fire or a whale swallowing Noah. And then they look at trans-rational occurrences. This is meditation, intuition, and they put that in the same boat. So to these people who fall in the rational end of the spectrum in Ken Wilber's philosophy, they look at intuition with the same skepticism as the idea of a whale swallowing Noah. Now, of course, one is magical thinking. It's pre-rational, but the other one is actually trans-rational. It is the next era of human development intuition, the idea of energy healing, the idea of working with the body's energy system, the idea of manifesting, these are transrational. But by lumping into the same bucket, you suddenly shut down to it. And so when you, if you fall for the pre-trans policy, and you can Google this, there's a beautiful article on it on Wikipedia, what typically happens is you shut yourself down to future human potential. And I think that's what happens to some writers like Carl Newport. They are completely resist, and also Neil deGrasse Tyson, completely resistant to these ideas. The reason I'm so open to them is because I've studied this. I've seen people do amazing things. I've seen remarkable acts of healing. I've seen remarkable acts of intuition. I've experienced this in my life. It's so important for us to have an open mind about this. And when you do, you start realizing that there are so many tools at your disposal to help you create this, for lack of a better word, the life of your dreams than the purely rational way, rational, me mechanistic way of approaching life. And so if, if I'm like, I'm inclined to believe what you're saying, I'm seeing it in action, I'm seeing how it's shifting me, I'm seeing how it's shaping me. 
of course, I'm moving down a path that's actually taking me further and further away from my family and my friends and the people who once knew me and even the way that I used to think. I'm I'm moving further and further into, hopefully, I say hopefully, but no, I'm going to believe this. I'm going to own it. I'm moving into a more peaceful, uh, uh, slower moving, happier uh, structure for life. But I almost feel like I need to put walls up or, or, or guard myself carefully, you know, um, I spent some time in the church and when I did, they would always like say like, you know, you got to be in the world, but not of the world. Like you, you, you watch what you watch and watch what you're consuming and be careful and put the guards up because they're the enemy's attacking and all that stuff. But my new version of the enemy is other people's fears, other people's doubt. The fact that I'm moving in a direction that they may not understand or yeah. even think is a little bizarre. And, and so like, if this takes time to learn, if it takes the year to shift your business to be able to build it up to your minimum uh, uh, income needs, like during that window of time, I almost feel like we're at the greatest risk because we haven't built the confidence to say, you know what, forget you, this is working for me. And we're like little children yeah, almost. Exactly. And, and so, I mean, and that's why I wrote my, my newest book, The Six Phase Meditation Method. There are six aspects of being human that I think if we learn to embrace, we move our lives towards phenomenal bliss, and also progress. I'm not using the word accomplishment. And so the six-phase meditation really took off. I, I put it up. Um, I started sharing it with, with a few people. And then I got asked to train um, several pro athletes. One of my students, um, Bianca Andrescu, she won the US Open. She beat Serena Williams. She credited this idea. Um, we've had rock stars like Miguel uh, in Billboard magazine talk about how he does this before getting on stage for a concert. We've had entrepreneurs build credit this with helping them build a $100 million company. But basically what the six-phase meditation does is it's six transcendent practices that you do in your head in the morning, in order, in 15 minutes, just 15 minutes. But these six practices up-level the six aspects of your soul that I believe are essential to building the life of your dreams. And uh, this is what I've been doing for almost 15 years. Um, as I started going deep in meditation. And then I've interviewed close to a thousand people for my podcast, for my books. I tried to bring together all their work and look for patterns. And these six attributes, these six human attributes are the ones to really focus on. And if you pay attention to these attributes, life unfolds for you in the most spectacular way. So when you're ready, I'd love to share these six attributes. Oh yeah, please. I, I, okay, I'm so, going to take notes. <laughs> so, so the first one is a feeling of compassion and unity. This is where you feel a oneness with all life. Now, many people are, uh, try to wonder, why is this important? Well, when you approach the world with love, you feel love back. Love is one of the most powerful forces for healing, for manifesting, for sparking intuitive ability. So the first step of the sixth phase is a simple, and this has been vetted by science, a simple, uh, I'd say about two minute practice that you run in your head. It's like a script. It's root science, Zen Roshi Buddhism, that activate and open your heart. And the rest of the day, you are walking the world with love. Now, the second attribute is bliss. So bliss is feelings of happiness. We spoke earlier about how when you have happiness, happiness is rocket fuel towards your goals. Most people, especially Americans, are told that you will be happy when you hit the accomplishment. You got to scrap that stuff, right? You got to be blissful. Bliss actually is rocket fuel towards productivity, not the other way around. This is, uh, Harvard has proven this, read the book. Happiness Advantage by Sean Aker. So what I do in the six phase is I teach you a specific science-backed technique, I believe it was UCLA that studied this, that activate your levels of happiness. And it takes only about two to three minutes a day. So now we're at about five minutes. Phase three is unfuck with ability. And here you learn a particular- I, I, love, <laughs> I love that word so much. I, I love that word. Yeah, unfuck with ability. You learn a particular technique to put you in a state where you feel safe, and again, there's a technique that you learn that you learn in the book. We don't have time for the techniques because they're fairly elaborate, but these techniques are all proven by science. Like the unfuckability technique is about eight steps. But when you do it, it is proven by science that you actually shift your brain wave. Uh, you develop left-right brain coherence and you develop a higher alpha wave amplitude, which all of this happens to correlate with the brain wave states of Zen Roshi monks who've been meditating for about two decades. Now, the first three phases are all about present feelings, bliss, compassion, unfuck with ability, which is a feeling of peace. And this is the Buddha nature. 
But there's also a badass nature that we need. The badass nature is the person who is seeking to better the world. Phase four, five, and six does that. Now, you're not seeking to better the world for accomplishment. You're seeking to better the world because you are human and you are part of this world. And this is your nature. Your nature is to help improve the world and well-being for other people. Phase four is where that begins. In phase four, you start with seeing a three-year vision for your life and going really deep in visualizing that vision. And there's a technique here for manifesting. Phase six is about commanding your perfect day. You go deep into commanding. The most amazing day is going to unfold for you. We have power over how our day unfolds. There's a debate whether this is manifesting or this is psychology. It doesn't matter. Either way, it works. The end result is there. You own your day. And then phase six, the final phase, is where we accept that we are particles of God. And it is a type of prayer to ask for help and support from higher intelligence. When you stack these six phases together, it takes about 15 minutes, but the results are mind-blowing. The, the book is available right now, um, mindvalley.com forward slash six. I'm giving away like access to Mindvalley's new meditation app. So this is a phenomenal app, almost 500 of top quality Mind Valley meditations and content available just for the price of a little book. And this is just something that my publisher insists I have to do before the um, the book <laughs> book comes out. So check it out, mindvalley.com forward slash six, but you will learn this technique and in 15 minutes a day, it will transform your life. I've been in the field of meditation for 20 years now and um, going on 20 years, it's gonna be 20 years and maybe five months. And a lot of the meditation that people do is quite useless. Why useless, that? not not that it's bad. It's just ineffective from a time perspective. The idea of like just just focusing on your breath or clearing your mind has a purpose, but it is hyper. It's highly ineffective. Today, with fMRI scans, you can actually analyze the brain and see exactly what's going on when the brain is meditating. And um, a lot of this stuff just isn't. It isn't actually working. The six phase is based on the science of what how meditation can literally transform your life, not just from an emotional state, but also from, from uh, the state of moving towards your goals or moving or daily progress. And um, this is what I advocate. So you know what bothers me most, and, and I speak to a lot of writers and it bothers them as well. Like what I can't understand is you have taken 20 years plus, right? Because all of your getting into this even before, Mm -hmm. to, to, to research this stuff, to learn this stuff. You guys have tons at Mindvalley. You have the most amazing resources, the most amazing contacts. You have a massive team. There's so much, there's so much in the engine going behind this to make sure that you can like basically spoon feed for me and make it easy for me exactly what I have to do. When I speak to an author who has learned all the hard lessons and then writes the book, and then, and then it takes the time to write the book. Right. And it's like, what, $18, $20. And then all I got to do is read it. And I could download everything that they've learned. I don't understand why more people don't access these things or do these things, other than the fact it's a little bit of effort, a little bit of work. True. Well, well, it's often because many books are written from a learning perspective, right? But because Mindvalley is a, is a transformation company. I mean, if you go to stories.mindvalley.com, I think we're, we just hit 17,000 case studies. I specialize in transformation. So in the six days meditation method, you don't just learn from the book. You're not just going through the written text. You get a little a QR code, which downloads an app where over six days, I work with your brain over six days, your brain, your emotions, and we program the technique into you. And on day seven, you are a different human being. That is the essence of transformational theory. So we look at five different uh, concepts from the University of Toronto that work with transformational theory, and we plug that into it. Most books don't do that. And that therefore, very often you read a book, but you don't experience the same shifts as the author. We try to change that. I love that. I was going to ask, though, if, if, if you had to make one recommendation like, hey, you don't have to start tomorrow. You don't have to start next week. You can start right now. Would it, would it be working through something like these six steps? Or oh, yeah. would it yes. be focusing on breathing? Or like, what would be the thing? Yes. No, absolutely don't focus on breathing. No, no, no. Don't meditate the way traditional uh, people think. <laughs> I mean, look, if you don't have a meditation practice, it's better than nothing. But if you want to really supercharge your meditation, uh, try what I'm suggesting. I'm saying this from experience because I, I was teaching meditation for the longest time. And all I wanted to do was get my students the best results in the shortest time possible. Because you know what? Everyone says they're busy. And most of the people I work with are world-class entrepreneurs, CEOs, like celebrities. They're the busiest people in the world. They don't have time for hour-long meditations. They want results fast. And that is actually doable. 
we see it in exercise. Remember when Tabata, four-minute exercise routines became a thing, yeah. or high-intensity interval training, and all of a sudden we were seeing that people were, were, were getting in four minutes of Tabata exercise, the equivalent of about 50 minutes of aerobics, right? The New York Times wrote about this, I believe, in July 2013. The same thing is happening now with meditation. With fMRI scans, you can analyze the human brain and see exactly what's happening, what's what's being lit up. And so, and with the number of people meditating right now, we're, we're gaining all of this knowledge, all of these experiences. And this is why there's a minimum effective dose response to meditation as well. And when you learn this, you get incredible, blissful, powerful states of being with tiny time investment. That's amazing. You mentioned earlier that you've interviewed well, close to a thousand people on your podcast yeah. and for your books. Yeah. I know within Mind Valley, you have some of some of the most remarkable teachers in the world, creating content, running lectures. Who's made the biggest impact on your life? Well, there's so many uh, because every major personal growth teacher in the world, I've probably interviewed, except Deepak Chopra. I haven't interviewed him yet. But um, Neil Donald Walsh is one of the greatest. Um, he was amazing. Uh, he's had a profound influence on me. I shared uh, Michael Beckwith's name. And then the third one would probably be Sri Kumar Rao. He's actually an MBA professor, but he brings um, he brings ancient philosophy into his MBA teachings of life. And and what did you learn? Well, there are, there are so many things. So let's talk about Michael Beckwith. I shared one idea from Michael Beckwith: mature versus immature wanting. Right. Let's talk about Neil Donald Walsh. From Neil Donald Walsh, what I learned about is the concepts of compassion and unity. Unity, Neil says, is the 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 high the val the, the the number one value of advanced civilizations, advanced species. Uh, unity meaning we see each other as deeply connected. From Sri Kumar Rao, teaches through ancient philosophers. And so one of the people he teaches through is Rumi. So um, there's this beautiful quote by Rumi, which I want to read out to you. This is probably one of those things that I learned from Rao and had a profound influence of me. It is... So, so on, on one particular day, maybe about seven years ago, when I was deeply stressed, I was interviewing Sri Kumar Rao, and and he he could sense that I was stressed. Uh, I really just had a bad day at work, and he said, "Vision, calm down." And um, no, he didn't, didn't actually say that. He, that would be a little bit demeaning. He more said, "Vision, I sense something is off. May I read you a poem?" Right, and this is the poem he read. So you asked me what I learned from Rao. Um, this is what I learned. He said, "Rumi said wrote this in the 13th century." When I run after what I think I want, my days are a furnace of stress and anxiety. If I sit in my own place of patience, what I need flows to me and without pain. From this, I understand that what I want also wants me, is looking for me and attracting me. There is a great secret here for anyone who can grasp it. From this, I understand that what I want also wants me, is looking for me and attracting me. Really interesting, right? I began to understand from this poem, and it took me years for these, these layers of understanding to come, that very often the goals that we want also want us in return. I remember in, interviewing Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey has a fascinating obsession with goal setting. When he was like 22 or 23, he wrote, I want to win a Best Actor Oscar. And he wrote that as his list of top 10 goals while sleeping in the top bunk as a college kid. 20 years later, he won Best Act, the Best Actor Oscar. It was 2010, I believe. And he said something to me in the interview. He said, the target attracts the arrow. It's not just that the arrow hits the target. The target attracts the arrow. There are ideas out there, according to Rumi, and according to our modern philosopher, Matthew McConaughey from Texas, the great actor, there are things out there that the universe wants to see created in the world. Maybe it's the iPhone. I believe Mind Valley was one of those things as well. Those are the targets. The targets attract the arrow. The universe will go and whisper to certain people, hey, build this. Hey, start this festival. Hey, write this book. And if you listen, the universe will be the benevolent boss who will then give you the resources, the guidance, the understanding, the synchronicities, the coincidence, the right connections to move you towards that creation. This is what Rumi meant by, if I sit in my own place of patience, what I need flows to me and without pain. From this, I understand that what I want also wants me, is looking for me, is attracting me. The target attracts the arrow. 
The universe knows what it needs to manifest in the world, and it will choose people and whisper in their ear. We call those whispers intuitive ideas, insight. Sometimes we call it luck. But when we act on those ideas, we have the most benevolent boss helping gently guide our arrow towards the target. This is why I believe in following your bliss, following your heart. This is why I don't really believe in what Cal Newport talks about. This is why I disagree with Neil deGrasse Tyson, who says that intuition is, is bunk. But I do trust Rumi. I trust Matthew McConaughey. I trust Sri Kumar Rao because I've seen this happen in my life over and over and over and over again. So I share that with your audience for what it's worth. I hope that inspires or gives someone what they need to hear today. Mm -hmm.